Welcome to the OmniTalk 2021 Ask an Expert series, the series where we go deep with experts on the key subjects and ideas that are shaping the future of retail. I am your host, Chris Walton, and joining me is Ann Mazinga. Today, we are going to talk resale, one of the hottest topics around, and how, if you're a retailer or a brand, you can make it very easy. So joining us today, we are pleased to welcome Adam Siegel, CEO and founder of Recurate. Adam, how are you today? I'm good. Very good to be here this morning. Thank you both so much for inviting me. We Absolutely. are now, where super are excited to have you. I've been waiting for this for a really long time, Adam. So and is super you, jazzed up. I am super jazzed up. Now, where are you calling from today? I'm uh, in the DC area, Washington, DC. DC calling like 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 it's a radio show. Listen to me. Listen to me. Now, which brings up a great point actually. Before we get started, now many of you are probably watching live on LinkedIn. So, should you have a question for Adam or for any of us on LinkedIn? You know, be sure to drop it into the chat and and keep it let's keep it open honest dialogue that's what our fans at omni talk love so ask your questions away i put put adam on the spot about uh resale and let's see where this conversation goes uh that's that's what makes all of this really great so all right well adam let's get started here uh tell us a little bit about yourself you know who you are where you came from how you got into the resale business it's a good question. How I got into the resale business, how I got into retail, retail. and fashion. It's a, it's a, a, a very windy journey, uh, I have to admit. Um, uh, when I, I, I grew up uh, with really only one focus, and that's engineering. Uh, really? I actually went okay. to school and grad school for aerospace engineering. So couldn't be more of a, a difficult, a different field from where I am today. Uh, but frankly, I, I never actually worked in that field. Um, I didn't know this. I've known you for like four years. I had no idea that that was what your background was. I had internships at at NASA and (laughs) GE aircraft engines, uh, in Lynn, Massachusetts. I've worked just above the factory where they produce, um, aircraft engines. Okay. Um, but yeah, never, never really, uh, worked there, um, in any full-time capacity. Uh, but instead my first role was in consulting just traditional consulting. Um, That was in Chicago for a a mid-sized firm called ZS Associates. Uh, And then in 2007, I went to grad school to get my MBA. And at that point, I I heard of this field called sustainability, corporate sustainability or corporate social responsibility. And I just got super excited by doing good um, in my full-time career. Uh, And so by the time I graduated, I was hell bent on getting a job in sustainability. Uh, Chris, you and I met while I was in my last role uh, at the trade association that represents the largest retailers. So slowly shifting over into the industry. Uh, and for me, the entry point was sustainability. Um, so I, I led that sustainability program for eight years. Uh, and in that time, got a really good sense for the industry and the trends. and. One of the trends that was most interesting to me, given my background in sustainability, was resale. Um, the most sustainable product you can buy is a used product. So that's how I meandered my way into this space. Well, and Adam, I remember, so I met you at Shop Talk. And mm-hmm. so Chris, you had already known Chris, but I met you at Shop Talk. And I remember you and I talking and like you giving me a demo of this product called Recurate. And I remember calling Chris right after and I'm like, oh my God, you got to see this thing. I love it. It's so smart. Tell tell the people listening today a little bit about Recurate um, and, and what it does, what it is. Well, thank you. I I, uh, I have to say the, the idea is very simple. Um, and especially as we show people, whether they're working at brands or even investors, um, by, by the time they see it, they're like, oh yeah, why, why doesn't every brand have this? Um, the concept is uh, just to enable peer-to-peer resale directly on a brand's website. So you can consider a part of a brand's website to be an experience similar to Poshmark, where that brand's past customers can go back to the brand's website, list an item that they previously purchased from the brand, uh, and then it displays directly, again, on the brand's site so that other customers that are more interested in buying pre-loved items can purchase it directly from the brand. Uh, The benefit, of course, is that these customers are already buying brand's products 
pre-loved, but they're buying them on third-party marketplaces like Poshmark, like the Real Real and any eBay. And so, you know, in that case, the brand is losing the customer and the transaction. So we're our goal is to to bring all of the benefits of resale back to the brands. You, okay, you said you dropped the word in there twice, actually, that I've never <laughs> I've actually never heard somebody say, and that was pre-love. Uh, yeah. What, what what is what does that mean? What 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 do you mean when you say why are you using that word pre-love? I I tend to use the the terms um, uh, secondhand or used or pre-loved or pre-owned. I, I tend to use them interchangeably. Okay. Uh, you know, frankly, some of them have different connotations than others, and um, and so depending on the brand you're talking about, the types of customer. But for me, uh, uh, pre-loved is just a, a product that has been um, loved and used before, but is it still in good enough condition that someone else can love it next. Uh, I have so to pre-love sometimes. I have to <laughs> say though, you guys, as a as a person who participates actively in the resale market. There is this sense, especially with like luxury or specialty hmm. items, there is this sense of like ownership and love that you have for a product that you don't just want to give it to the goodwill or like drop it off, you know, like it, it's hard to part with. And so I think part of this experience or this circular economy that I think is, is just in the psychology of the consumer is like, it's not just going, getting tossed away. It's being given to somebody or being purchased by somebody who will care for that item um, in the same way that you did. So I like the word pre-loved quite a bit just well, just a personal anecdote there but <laughs> I, I I think I think that's really interesting and it reminds me of some research that I saw a while back now you know we only started this business a year ago but I've I've certainly been engaged in the circular economy for a while and uh, I want to say maybe as long as five years or so ago um, I had the chance to uh, get my hands on a, a uh, consumer insights report that related mm. to pre-love. And one of the things that we found is that, no surprise, consumers have a, a whole lot of stuff in their closets and under their beds that they're no longer using or wearing. Mm. Um, but one of the biggest barriers for them to get rid of it is that they had, um, they had a, um, a sort of um, concern about where it might go and and, a, and they felt responsive responsible for finding good homes for those new items mm -hmm. so yeah people don't want to just throw away things mm -hmm. that they think still have value they don't necessarily want to go and give it to goodwill because they're uncertain whether or not those items are actually going to be well used so they are looking for good homes because they feel personally connected to um, to those items, and and so I think uh, uh, platforms like ours make them feel comfortable about where those items are going to go next. That's really unique. Yeah, I, I I've never thought about that either. How like the items that we don't clean out of our closet probably have some special emotional attachment. That's what you're hitting on there. And that mm -hmm. there's a reason we've kept them around. So if we are going to get rid of them, it still it, brings it, us joy as Marie yeah, Kondo it, would say. So you yeah. can't really part with yeah. it as easy. Emotional say. attachment or some sort right. of responsibility for finding a, a good use or a new home for those items. Even if you're not emotionally attached to it now, you might still feel responsible because you think the item has value and you don't want to just uh, throw it out. Right, right, right. Yeah, you're bequeathing it to somebody else in a lot of ways. So, okay, so a lot of people are getting into this, though, Adam. So, we, you know, there's been a lot of news around Nike, Lululemon going after this business. I want to hit on the specifics, too, about what you guys do. So, right, like I, the key thing here is you're working with the brands on their own websites to bring this alive, to kind of keep people in that brand, whether they, you know, love the product at first purchase, now they want to resell the product and possibly get back into the cycle again. Talk about how you make all that happen, because it seems really intuitive when you talk about it out loud, and yet the first we're seeing it. So how are you doing that? Uh, yeah, so in short, we're a technology company. We, we've developed an e-commerce integration uh, where we can integrate directly with any brand's website. So uh, if, if they have a site, which I hope they do now, um, we can <laughs> enable this, this new experience. Uh, and, and what makes us especially unique is the scalability of it, because you can think about existing third-party resale marketplaces in two categories. 
the one category is the type of resale marketplaces that collect items. And then they have to, of course, um, perform certain operations on them, inspect them, repair them, clean them, uh, inventory them. them, warehouse them, et cetera. And there's a lot of benefit to that, of course, um, but it's also very costly. Uh, and then there's other third party marketplaces that are completely peer to peer where you list an item, but you keep it in your closet until it sells and then you send it on to that next customer. So those two, those two markets have existed for a long time already and, and sites like ThreadUp and Poshmark are examples in both of those categories. Uh, the, the same applies for and stores. Have, oh, sorry, Adam. I was going to say stores have existed that way too, when you really think about it. There's stores set up that way. Yeah. Uh, but, but there isn't necessarily even on the physical or digital side, what you're about to talk about. Yeah, That's well, fascinating. It, exactly. Well, so as, as it relates to branded re-commerce in particular, where the brand is the center point for the resale transaction, both of those um, should exist because there's different customers that are interested in, in both uh, of those models. Um, we're uh, providing that peer-to-peer -peer option. So that's the reason why we're so scalable is that neither we nor the brand takes possession or ownership of, of the items. And, and so it's, it's solely um, a technology play where, where we can connect the customers that have product with the, connect, with the customers that are looking for pre-loved items. Is there a, now is there an authentication piece within this too because you're keeping it within the brand so you you know with extra certainty that that item is being resold through this brand because it was purchased through that brand before is that is that part of this yeah so I'll I'll tell you where we are today but okay. the, the fun part of this business is where we're going um, so where where we are today is that the primary mechanism for listing an item that you want to sell is by going into your purchase history and finding that item. So in other words, you can't go and sell a hundred Gucci bags if you've never purchased a Gucci bag. It has to be in your purchase history. Like that. Um, then we also have a, um, a review process where we review all of the listings to determine you know, which ones are appropriate or not. And embedded in that is a trust score so that we know how trustworthy that seller is. And then on the back end of, of um, the transaction, once the item is delivered, we automatically email the buyer and ask them to confirm that product. So we have today mechanisms both at the beginning and end of the transaction to, to verify the validity of the item and the condition of the item and the trustworthiness of the seller. Uh, but where we're going, I said the fun part, is um, a technology that I'm sure you've heard a lot about recently and, and maybe talked about on this show, NFTs. Yep. Uh, oh, great. Uh, and, and NFTs have a whole range of- Oh, wow, of, okay. Holy NFTs shit. Have, have a whole range of, of use cases. Uh, I actually bought my first NFT a couple of weeks ago and it's a, a cool little GIF. I'll, I'll, I'll show you if, uh, if we have yeah. a chance at the end of this. Um, I bought it for 20 bucks and I'm not sure why it's, it's worth that much, but the, to me, the, the, the real use, or at least the immediate use case is to authenticate the, um, the authentic authenticity of items. Uh, and we are already seeing, especially luxury brands starting to add QR codes or RFID tags right. that are unique to every single item that they sell. And so with that technology, we can be certain that the item you say you're selling is the item um, that you are, that you have. And once it's delivered, we can confirm that it was the correct item that was delivered. So that, that will be wow. uh, true remote authentication. I think that's a huge part of this too, Adam. I mean, I think in the, in the resale community, you know, even brands that have been around and are established, like the real, real, for example, are among the big, you know, resale communities, um, like influencers, they're kind of looked down upon because you still have this issue of whether or not these items are authenticated. And even when you have experts who are apparently doing this, I think that's what I love about the platform that you guys have set up is that you 
keep everything in the brand's ecosystem. So, you know, you can see the transaction happening um, all within the brand site. I, and I want, I want you to tell people a little bit about what happens from a customer perspective too. Like what's happening on my side when I'm going to say the Gucci site and I, I want to shop pre-loved items. Tell me what that transaction looks like and how that works um, as opposed to maybe like what I'd be familiar with on a Poshmark or something. Right, right. Well, I, I should probably first caveat that I know I, I mentioned Gucci as an example. We, we're not working with Gucci yet, but Gucci, if you're <laughs> yes. listening, if you're listening <laughs> yes. Yes. I'd love to talk. Um, but uh, yeah, the, 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 um, the customer journey, um, very simple. Uh, if you've ever purchased something from that brand in the past, you can log into that brand's website uh, at that point, you'll get a list of all of the items that you previously purchased, uh, and there'll be a button next to each one that says something like, sell this item used. Um, if you want to sell that item, you click that button, you get to a, a listing form. You can think of it kind of like listing on eBay or Poshmark, uh, but it's a much easier listing process because right. if you go to Poshmark, they have no idea what you're selling. But we know almost everything about what you're selling because we're connected with that brand. So we know, um, well, we have the original imagery of the product. We have the description of the product. We have the material composition, the age of the item, the original price, the price. Reviews. <laughs> yeah, reviews, all of that stuff. So, you know, whereas if you were to list it on a third party site, there's a whole lot of stuff you need to complete. And frankly, that is a, a a painful process. There is a lot of friction in that. Our goal is to significantly reduce the friction. So we complete 80% of the listing because we have all that information. All we ask for is a few images of the product today. Uh, you tell us the condition of the item today, because of course it's different sure. from when you bought it. Um, we all recommend a price for you to sell it at so that you can sell it quickly. And then, um, and then you list it. Uh, so, so the listing process, the goal for that is, is very simple. Um, if you want, I, I can explain, you know, what happens next. Yeah, yeah please, I think, go for I it. think yeah. tell us about it. It'd be great to hear it. Great. Okay. So you've listed a product and uh, imagine that you've gone to Gucci.com. You've, uh, you've found that, um, that handbag from uh, your purchase history, you've listed it. So the next step in the process is that we'll review it. Um, make sure that you're a valid um, seller of that item, um, that you, know, you, ha you have a history with the brand and that you're trustworthy and that the images look good because eventually they will display on the brand's website. And, and once we do approve you, then your product, your listing will go directly on the site. So again, we don't work with Gucci, but if you go to Mara Hoffman or Laline, you know, well-known uh, fashion, uh, trendy brands, uh, not trendy, but, uh, you know, long, long time fashion brands in New York, um, you can go to their website and you'll see there's a section of their site in, in the header navigation uh, where you can review, where you can view all of the uh, pre-loved items that are available for sale. And you'll see it's a, a really nice on-brand interface. Um, and if you find an item that you want to purchase, you just click into it and check out just like normal. So it's the same checkout process to buy a used item as it is to buy a new item. And what that means is that the brand gets all of the data associated with that customer in the sale. And it goes into the same marketing um, funnels and, uh, and customer database. So the brand maintains all of that data. And then we'll ping the seller and say, uh, hey, your item was sold. Uh, here's a shipping label. We'll prepay the shipping label. Uh, all you need to do is print it out and send that item to the new buyer. It's a, a, a very simple process to list and then sell the item. And then Adam, tell me a little bit about, because I think the other cool thing about this from a brand's perspective, especially, is what happens with payment. So traditionally, when I sell something on, say, like Poshmark, I can get credit a saved to my Poshmark account, or I can cash out. But what, what is really unique about Recurate is about how that payment process works and kind of keeps you in the brand. So tell us a little bit about that too. Yeah. So the, what is similar is um, that we offer two forms of payout, uh, store credit for the brand um, or cash. 
and brands get to determine uh, all of the parameters here. So actually most of the brands that we work with, we're working with about 20 brands right now. Most of the ones that we work with, uh, well, all of them offer store credit. Of course, that makes sense because they want to keep right. the customer. Um, but only about four of them uh, offer a cash payout option as well. So you get to choose and you also get to choose the payout percentage. So right. with Poshmark, you're getting paid out 80% of that sale. If you list an item for $100, you will get $80. That's just known on Poshmark, they take 20%. But because this is owned and run by the brand, we find that brands often like to pay out 100% in store mm -hmm. credit. And that's because this is really wow. about loyalty and, and you know customer reacquisition. And you'll find if you dive into it, the financials actually are very favorable to the brand uh, to do it in that way as a way to keep the customer. Um, so most of our brands pay out 100% in store credit and something like 70 to 80% in cash if they even choose to pay out with that option. So and that's a really big deal. I think for those of you who are not familiar really with resale or who are just getting into it, like that 80%, you know, really adds up those fees add up. So now you're, you're really incentivizing your, your community to go back and be with the brand to keep the transactions happening within the brand. And it helps when you're searching for new products too. It's so much simpler to search, you know, I know I want this, you know, Gucci bag in particular, and this is the one that I, you know, I have all of these to choose from um, and all transacting and happening and keeping me in the Gucci ecosystem. But Adam, what's going on? Like with this being so popular, what's still keeping brands from like taking this leap? Because I mean, I think there's still some hesitancy here, but, but what are you encountering and how, how can you help? You know, um, when I first got into this year, 2021, yeah. I, I was at least to myself and, and to my business partner calling this year, the year of branded resale. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do truly believe that. I think it's probably a year of a lot of things. So I, <laughs> I, 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 won't, I won't assume that that's the only thing that brands are thinking about, but, um, but you will see, oh, we, we already have seen a number of big announcements and we'll continue to see a number of big announcements. And I think that's just because people realized that this trend is here to stay. Um, and, uh, and frankly, brands are, are losing customers and transactions uh, when, every day that they're not engaged in this. Um, the, the, the obstacles that we see are the standard obstacles. You know, big companies take time to make big decisions. This is a big decision. Um, if, if you're working with a brand on something that's, you know, historically been a, a core function of a brand, then you know who the decision maker is. But for something like this, it's, it's, it's a new concept. And so it's not clear in every company who's the right decision maker. Uh, we've noticed that sometimes it's head of marketing or head of digital e-com, yeah. um, but every brand's different and the personality and culture of them are, are different. And so, you know, just, it takes time to um, figure out the right people and for them to come together and, and determine if and when they want to do this. So I'd say Adam, that, what some that of the, tends to be the biggest. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. What is some of the what are some of the core things you hear as you're pitching the brands? Like, is it concern over just getting into resale themselves and putting it on their site for the first time? You know, is it integration? Like, what are the things that you hear? And then, you know, how do you allay their fears? Is, I think you said you've stood up twenty different brands on this concept right now. Yeah, I, the 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 biggest thing that we tend to hear is. Um, and no surprise, uh, you know, I come from a, a background working with brands, as does my partner. Um, people spend a lot of time uh, making sure that they preserve the brand. You know, they there's a certain uh, reputation that they want that brand to have, and anything new, especially a new channel like this. Um, it just, it takes them time to understand what that's going to look like. Um, so one thing that we've thought a whole lot about is buyer protections. You know, this is peer to peer. 
uh, brands understand this behavior is already happening for their products. It's just happening on Poshmark, but they get concerned that if they bring a, an experience like this to their own website, then you know their their brand's reputation is at stake if if things were to go wrong. And so for that reason, that uh, finding ways to protect the buyer if they do have a bad experience, we, which we've actually found to be exceedingly rare, um, uh, we want to make sure that that customer still leaves with a good taste in their mouth. Um, so that actually tends to be the, the single biggest uh, right. question. It doesn't, it, it has never really inhibited us from working with brands because I think they recognize that, you know, with, with good protections, we can overcome that challenge. Uh, but it is the, the the first question that brands tend to ask. That makes sense. So, Adam, now if we're looking at like where things are going in this space, we're starting to look at, we're going to regroup with you in October to get a second look and just see, you know, what else happened in the year of 2021. If it's this year of resale, which like you said, I think that there's no way that we won't continue to see this trending. I think it's, you know, it's resale is supposed to be a $15 billion industry by 2023. I think we're well on our way to doing that. Is there anything else, the people that are listening to this right now, is there anything else that you would recommend that they kind of be paying attention to? I mean, obviously they should get in, in contact with you if they have specific questions about Recurate, but when we think about resale as a bigger trend, is there anything that people should be paying attention to that you think they aren't? Um, well, I maybe what's not completely clear is what type of customer is engaging in the resale market. Okay. Um, what's interesting to me and, and, you know, consumers always surprise me, uh, is that this is happening across the board from, um, you know, older generations to younger generations, but it does seem to be that Gen Z is particularly leading the charge. And I okay. think that's because Poshmark and Depop and the Real Real and others have made it cool uh, to buy used. And and I think that there's this this whole generation of people who, when they think about buying something, their first thought is, where can I get it used? Where can I get it pre-loved? Right. And so currently, the first place they go is Poshmark or Depop or the Real Real. They're not thinking to go to that brand's website. Um, and so in my mind, uh, even beyond all of the other reasons I described before around loyalty, um, customer reacquisition and stuff like that, even beyond all of those other benefits for engaging in resale, probably the primary benefit is to begin to engage with that next generation of, of customers of yours. That's a key point too. I mean, I, I don't think we can understate that. Like I was just, I actually was just listening to something the other day where they were looking at just population cohorts too. And I, I wanna make sure I get the statistic right here, but they were saying that young adults in their twenties are now almost 2 million people in the US, you know, larger than say people in their thirties. Like this is a massive consumption cohort that people need to start taking a look at pretty hard to the point of what you're saying. And this seems to be a trend that that, that generation particularly is starting to ride. Um, are you see that's the part that surprised me in this conversation though, Adam, like, are you, it, are you, so there's this actual like kind of stay in the brand zeitgeist around that trend too, where people will, you know, want to enter, you know, maybe it's through resale or just buying something. And then they, they, they kind of stay in that and they exhibit that behavior over and over again within that same brand. I know, and by the way, and I've never seen as geeked up ever for a podcast. Like I can tell just how enthusiastic she is. And I know she feels this way about this subject, but so that that's my big takeaway is that you're seeing that. So that's, am I hearing that the right way? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's no surprise that the the reason why fast fashion was so successful over the past 10 or 20 years is because the consumer behavior has been about, you know, purchasing new items quickly. Uh, but I think I think the the responsibility or unsustainability of that has caught on with customers now. It's not that they don't like that behavior it's just they don't feel good uh, exhibiting that behavior and engaging in the resale marketplace is a way that they can um kind of have their cake and eat it too uh, you know, of it course fits, with it makes you look all good. things sustainability it's it's never that simple but um but we certainly do see that behavior one actually for what it's worth one one other thing that i think about a lot 
is the behavior for renting items. Um, of course, the real uh, the uh, rent the runway sure. has grown tremendously um, over the past decade. I think uh, uh, COVID un was an unfortunate um, uh, you know situation that they had to contend with, but I think it was also for a similar customer behavior that people like having new things. Um, and engaging in resale is is another way that that people can exhibit a similar behavior uh, uh, as rental. Yeah, there's well, a lot of benefits. Oh, sorry, I was just saying like one plus one equals three. You've got hmm. you get into more products more quickly. It's cheaper, and then you also actually make money as you're doing it in theory on both sides, right? That was the right. key that you talked about the brands and the consumer. yeah, yeah, money, money, loyalty. Um, uh, community. Yeah, there's there's a number of benefits, both tangible and, and the sort of intangible that uh, the brands can get from engaging in resale. And access to your brand. Like Chris just mentioned, 2 million yeah. people in Gen Z. Like this is a, this, one of the smartest ways, I think, that you can, right. as a brand, be thinking about how to introduce that younger generation to your brand and keep them in the brand for the their, their lives, you know? Like yeah. People were giving me a hard time when I posted, we were talking about Lululemon getting into resale and people were like, no one's going to buy Lululemon sweaty leggings. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, they do. Oh, yeah, and they it's, do. It, you know, if, if you can get in at $25 for a pair of leggings and yeah. you can sell them back on the site, you know, like we're seeing this just go across multiple categories. It's not just luxury either. No and way. I think that's really yeah. important too, Adam. I mean, the, who can work with Rikiri? Like, tell us about the brands that you're working with, and and. Well, I th I think what you just said was a great example. Of that I mean that that this whole topic amps me up because when I first started this business, I assumed that there was really only a certain category of brands that would benefit from what we're doing, the the higher end, more premium brands that um, uh, that might be out of the range for most customers. But yeah, I've, I, as I've gotten farther into this, I've realized that it's really for anyone. Right. Um, and and I said it before, and I'll say it again. Customers always surprise me. Uh, and and for every brand that I talk to, whether it's high end, mid market, or or lower, um, the first thing I do is search for their brand on Poshmark or eBay, and mm -hmm. you'll find thousands of listings, yeah, sometimes right. tens or hundreds of thousands of listings for that brand. So if you ever encounter someone that says, nobody's ever going to buy X, right. just show them. People are buying and selling this stuff all the time. Yeah, th that's a huge point to end on too. Like the opportunity cost of this is really small. I mean, it's, I mean, it's really small. Like you, you either do it or you don't, right? Like you either capture the volume that's out there or you don't. And if there's not that much, big deal like it's 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 digital it's e-commerce it doesn't take that much to stand this up so like you can either try to go get it or like to your point it's ha likely happening and just go let somebody else do it instead like that's basically what we're talking about it's not it's not actually that dissimilar than like some of this general e-commerce principles in terms of how you think about these things well what's next for you man like what if Anne said we're gonna have you on again i think about six months from now what are you focused on what can we expect from you uh, for us, it's it's really um, continuing to build the product, build new features onto the product, uh, engaging with um, partners that can help with authentication, like I was saying with NFT and stuff like that. So that's all on the product side. Um, and then for us, it's uh, it's really team building and partnership building. So so um, launching with more and uh, more diverse brands. So you'll you'll see a number of announcements over the next several months with brands that we'll be launching with soon. And, and hopefully that will continue over the course of the year. Yeah, you guys just had that big investment three over $3 million. So it sounds like yeah, kind of scaling up here is kind of the next is the next big focus for you. Well, hey, man, congrats. And no joke. I mean, I've probably done 200 300 of these interviews with Anne. And I honestly have got to say I have a never excited. seen Anne more excited yeah. than she is in this interview so th thanks for coming on today i'm excited already to have you back thanks for doing the chat with us on, on linkedin if people want to get a hold of you what's the best way for them to do that just feel free to reach out uh, i'll put it in the chat but my email address is adam at recurate.com or you can go to our website and find a link there uh, for everyone out there adam siegel founder and ceo of recurate i think ann's favorite new entrepreneur 
I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I'm Without guessing that's true. Without a doubt. Okay, good. We got the validation there. But again, Adam Siegel, thanks so much for coming on. To everyone watching, to everyone listening, as always, be careful out there.